I'm going to take some time to editorialize again. And uh, I'm going to start in Hebrews chapter 10. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 10. And uh, just uh, verse 36. Hebrews 10, 36. <clears throat> he said, You have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what was promised. Of course, this was written to the church directly in Jerusalem about in preparation for the AD 70 destruction and uh, the you know but it applies to those of us in our age who are waiting for Jesus second coming and the the events that are coming upon the world and I wanted to backtrack and to to try to bring out something I think is major significance uh, you know in a in a big picture way you know the the fact that the restoration movement came off the ground in the United States of America in, say, 1827, you know, the hand of God was very much involved in that because there was a people that was specifically prepared. And what God had to do, uh, you know, is, uh, you know, to, to make that happen, again, pretty interesting. The um, I'm going to read a little section out of the series of books by a guy named Dale Van Every. He was a college professor, but, you know, sometimes you read these books, you know, like, uh, say, the, 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 the Killing of Lincoln or, or, you know, John Adams or something. The guy did research for the book and then put the book together. This guy, you can tell he's taught this stuff, and then this is an outgrowth of the stuff he's taught. He didn't try to do research for the book. The book is an outgrowth of a, of a lifetime of research. And specifically talking about the, the frontier people, you know, he, he goes through in a series of four books and really documents that it was the frontier people that made America. The, the guys that uh, crossed the uh, Appalachian Ridge in the uh, beginning of 1763 when they weren't supposed to, and uh, they were opposed at every front. And so this is the final section of the final book here. It says, uh, the ultimate feat of the frontier people, the ultimate feat was crossing the continent to, to get to Oregon to get to California. Okay? It said the ultimate feat was in many ways more astounding than any of their previous achievements. See, they crossed the Appalachians, uh, held the Appalachians through the, the Revolutionary War, the wet area west of the Appalachians. They crossed into Missouri. Um, then they they went into Texas. Uh, you know, I mean, it was uh, you know Ohio. It's quite a quite a battle, really, every step of the way. So he said the the final accomplishment was more astounding. He says they were not tormented by the afflictions of unending win Indian War, which had assailed all their former advances, but they were committed to other hazards as fearful. So. In other words, when they first crossed the Appalachians, okay, the, the Shawnee, you know, the Mingo, you know, the Delaware, just constantly attacking these guys, constant, constant, constant. If you ever read any of the Zane Gray series on, uh, you know, the around Fort Henry, uh, which eventually became <coughs> Wheeling, uh, West Virginia, uh, they named the forts after, you know, people of importance. Fort Knox was named after America's first uh, Secretary of War. <coughs> <clears throat> and uh, so Fort Henry was named after Patrick Henry because the Westerners highly regarded Patrick Henry as the exponent of, of freedom. <clears throat> so tremendous. Every one of these guys, they, they came in, they built stations. Um, <clears throat> the word ranch didn't come into existence until the early 1800s. Ranch is coming from the Spanish side. But uh, station was always the word that was used before then and <clears throat> still used today in places like New Zealand and Australia. Okay, I mean, they're, they're down there talking about a, a sheep station, you know, and I'm thinking a spot where you ship sheep from, but no, sheep station is a, is a big sheep ranch is what we would call it, okay, but station, and that was the word for it in the early days of, of the Republic. <clears throat> the uh, family groups of men, women, and children, grandmothers, babies, cattle, chickens, dogs, <clears throat> were embarking upon a journey of many months to be totally dependent upon their own resources. I'm emphasizing that, dependent upon their own resources and oppressed by heat, cold, storms, starvation, 
an unremitting toil. Some of the way across, was across country so featureless that their progress was inappreciable. If you've even driven across Kansas, you know, <laughs> you know okay, or Nebraska, you know, they followed the, uh, <clears throat> they followed the Platte River uh, west. You know, the, uh, the uh, Oregon Trail was on the south side of the Platte. The Mormon Trail was on the north side, okay? And, but they followed the Platte, you know, Chimney Rock, you know, Independence. Um, you, know, <clears throat> you know, they traveled 10 miles, and how far did they think they went? Can you imagine traveling 10 miles a day <clears throat> across this expanse? You get her? See, I mean, it, you know, it's... And you don't want to minimize that. <clears throat> At other stages, they awaited rushing rivers to sweep away their wagons, precipices up which their wagons must be lifted by ropes, burning deserts in which their oxen sickened. Always there was the need for desperate hurry, since delay meant the threat of death to all in the winter snows of the last mountain barrier. See, again, that happened to Katie's family. You know, they... <clears throat> You know, decided they they were not going to go to the Portland area. They're going to go to the Eugene area, in 1853. So Joe Meeks, who was one of the famous mountain men, was their guide, and uh, he took them as far as uh, Central Oregon. He said, "Just stay south of those peaks there, the uh, Three Sisters, and you'll be fine." Well, then the big fog came in for weeks. See, and so they find out that they're driving in circles, and they survive by boiling uh, oxen hooves. Not untypical of, you know, the, the, the type of things that these guys went through. See, we're talking, you know, remember the theme here is endurance, okay? <clears throat> Yet in their astounding decision to make the venture did not appear to them so strange and certainly not nearly so demented as it appeared to Easterners then and maybe to us now. In other words, okay, we have fear of death pounded at us, fear of death pounded at us. Safety, 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 right? Okay. I mean, in my day, the kids never even wore bicycle helmets. Never heard of them. Okay. Did we have any crashes? Yep. Still got a couple scars. You know? <laughs> but I mean, you know, you just, I mean, see, what, but that, what that does, that pounds fear of death into people's heads. See, which is Satan's goal, ultimately. It's through fear of death, people are held in subjection all their lives, okay? Um, so, you know, okay, so we're going to cross um, 2,000, almost 2,000 miles of, uh, you know, trackless wonders. And, uh, well, there is a track, but, uh, you know, I mean, cholera, wipe, wipe, wipe out whole wagon trains. See, so they, they knew that, there's a good possibility that many of them would die on the way, okay? What if safety and, f and fear of death was the factor? They would have never done it. See, and that's why he said it appeared to demented to the Easterners who were a little bit more interested in comfort, okay? And to us now, he said, okay? Uh, they confidently expected to survive by resort to the same practices by which they and their forefathers had so far survived. They were a hunting people who had proved their ability to live off the country no matter where they wandered. Their transport procedures were not new or untried. They had for generations been accustomed not only to wandering, but wandering by wagon. Daniel Boone's family had in 1752 moved by wagon from Pennsylvania to the Yadkin, Yadkin being in North Carolina. Okay. So, um, Daniel Boone's ancestors were Quakers, Pennsylvania Quakers. But you know, uh, Daniel Boone with his rifle was no Quaker. <laughs> okay. um, by the way, you know, quite a few of Daniel Boone's family members died in the process of trying to get into what's now Kentucky. I mean, I mean that was risk they took. They, you know, it was part of their life. No whining over the fact that they, you know, were going to lose family members. No whining. They, you know, could, yeah, it could happen. The flatboat immigrants crossed the Alleghenies by wagons and then taken their wagons onto Kentucky aboard their rafts. Okay, as soon as they could get to the Monongahela, uh, which is one of the main tributaries feeding into the Ohio at Pittsburgh, they, could, uh, they built flatboats, and uh, they'd just sail the flatboats. It was a big major invention, a flatboat was, 
um, because they, you know, up to this point, all the boats that they built, you know, were not only for taking things downriver, but to get back upriver. Okay, because they're going to have to fight the Mississippi current, fight the Ohio River current. And so somebody, a guy by the name of Yoder in Pennsylvania, uh, figured out, hey, I'll just build a big flat boat, and when I get to the end of the line, sell the wood. <laughs> just tear her apart and, or just leave her on the bank, okay? So they, the, the flat boat became the, one of the major means by which they went west. So they made wagons, so they got the flat boat, they loaded the wagons on the flat boat, they came to Limestone Trick, Creek in Kentucky, which is near um, Mayf Mayfield, Kentucky, and then up into the, the Kentucky wilderness, okay? So the wagons had rolled down the Holston. Holston is one of the tributaries to the Tennessee, and you could get there from uh, the Shenandoah Valley in Virginia. Roll the wagons in there, and then after 1796, over the Wilderness Road. So they had 200 miles of Wilderness Road to get from the Holston into the Cumberland of Kentucky and in that part of Tennessee. The nearer plains then had be, been constantly crossed by wagons since 1822. So, you know, plains of Illinois and, uh, you know, and Missouri crossed, okay? But when they, once they hit west of Missouri, the, the, the plains were a tremendous barrier. No wood, no water, okay? And uh, he makes a point here that what it took to conquer the plains was the invention of the windmill for water, barbed wire to keep your animals in, <coughs> and the railroad. You know, I mean, right here, southwest Montana, they hit gold in 1862 in Bannock, okay? 1863 in, in Virginia City, okay? Southwest Montana is isolated. As soon as the first snows hit in mid-October, you know, you're not... You can get horses, you know, ride a horse, but you're not getting wagons in and out. So if it's not in here by early October, you're, you're not getting it. And uh, see, well, what made the difference? I think it was 1882, I think, that the Northern Pacific came through. And once the Northern Pacific came through, see, that opened it up. Uh, just, just one small example, um, you know, because they didn't have it. Um, before October, they didn't have it. One year, they ran short on flour in Virginia City. You could buy an ounce of flour for an ounce of gold. Okay, see, so that's uh, $2,300 uh, per ounce of flour, just put it in today's terms, okay? Just, I mean, to get a perspective here on these type of people, right? The, uh, Joel Walker, the first settler to take his family all the way to Oregon, had in his youth traveled by wagon with his father's family from eastern Tennessee to western Missouri. One novelty confronting the transcontinental immigrants of the 1840s was the circumstance that this was a longer haul than any they had formerly attempted. I mean, you're crossing, two th if you ever look at a map and you see area east of the Mississippi, contrast to the area west of the Mississippi, See, they, this is all east of the Mississippi up to this point for the most part. See, to get west of the Mississippi, that's a tremendous barrier. Again, you guys that have driven that, you got an idea what that's like, right? Otherwise, they were taking with them the familiar f uh, frontier way of life they'd always known, the same stockade, the same community doc democracy, the same total self-reliance, okay? Okay, every wagon train had a constitution. You can actually go online and see the Constitution that they wrote for the five wagons in uh, Uncle Vindy McClure's wagon train going out of Oaktown, Indiana, Katie's ancestors. For five of them, most of them family members, they wrote a Constitution. He said, we're all agreeing to this before we start. The rules, the way, see, it's going to be orderly. And there are times they kick people off the wagon train because they wouldn't follow the rules. I mean, you read the story of the Donner wagon train, you'll see some interesting things. But, I mean, see, but again, they're bringing order, self-government, and self-reliance. Very important here, what I'm talking about. What they most of all were taking with them was the same compulsive determination 
never rest long in one place while there still remained new country which they had not yet seen. See, the first uh, Mexico, which held Texas, I mean, uh, Mexico became independent of Spain in around 1810 or 1815. Mexico actually at first invited uh, the guys from Tennessee to come in because they thought it would help, I mean, it's very unpopular, they thought it helped help balance off the Indians. See, what they didn't realize is these guys coming in from Tennessee were bringing an American way of life. And it was only a, a matter of time uh, when you're going to have Texican independence, see, in 1836, with the Lone Star Republic set up as a republic, the uh, Constitution written by Sam Houston himself. See, they're bringing, they're bringing a way of life is what I'm driving at. Okay, California, right? The bearer what? Republic. Said right on the on the flag, the bear republic. Okay, <coughs> you know. never mind. <laughs> we, 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 I think uh, sixty-five percent of California's population is foreign-born. They got no clue. See, this American way of life, see, is is, is critical here. See, it's not and not just because it's an American way of life, but it sets the stage for the gospel. That's the, state, that's the big thing here. He said they were truly an extraordinary people. While the American world as we know it was built so largely on what they represented and what they, what they accomplished, it's also lost much by their passing. So I picked, uh, so Bozeman Papers published Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And, uh, you know, I said, you know, I mean, print is going out of the way. So out of Saturday's paper here, the headline article, the lead article in Saturday's paper, which is also Sunday's paper because there's no Sunday paper, right? Uh, the lead article is entitled Growing Pains. Now catch this. Bozeman's boom depends upon immigrants but struggles to support them. Okay, the government's supposed to take care of you, right? And they tell the story about how poor Rosa, you know, saw snowflakes fall and she thought they were pieces of cotton. Come on. <laughs> you know, whine, 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 whine. Okay? Need somebody to take care of us, right? And uh, the... Uh, government likes it that way. See, the government sets up people to be whiners because then they all appeal to the government to take care of them, which is causes the growth of government, so that's the government's goal. Well, Last night I heard on, on Fox that they, I can't say they've uncovered because they haven't uncovered it yet, but in the last five years, California has uh, designated five billion dollars to help the homeless, okay? But they don't know where the money went. Right. <laughs> Surprise. Uh, they did, uh, when, when they inquire in it, they get no answer, okay? They did trace one gal through the banking system on it. Um, last year, her salary was $600,000. Yeah, and she was homeless. To, to help the homeless. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But none of the money ever got to the homeless. Never, never, no. Not a dime. Not a dime. Yeah. See, that's typical. I mean, any welfare system, see, the, you know, the you know, somebody described it as, okay, taking blood out of your right arm, transferring it to the left arm, and losing at least 80% in the process. <laughs> yeah, I mean, see, but that's, see, Marxism is designed to do that. It's, it's designed to destroy the economy. So I remember Rose Wilder Lane was uh, uh, Laura Ingalls Wilder's daughter. Rose Wilder Lane was a, as an author, 
And she's the one that actually persuaded her mom to write the Little House on the Prairie series, okay? Which, of course, talked about, you know, big house in the woods and, you know, or little house in the big woods and little house in the prairie. You know, that was frontier people. Those are frontier people. And, uh, you know, Rose Wilder Lane in about 1920 said that the Americans are becoming a very weak people. 1920, that's 100 years ago. Okay? So... Now, when it comes to evangelism, all right, see if we can make this practical. So if your only mechanism is to try to get people through the door of your church building and uh, to try to get them enamored with your local church fellowship and, uh, you know, how wonderful everybody is and, you know, the awesome youth groups you have and the, the band, you know, or the a cappella singers or whatever it is, you know, if you're, that's your goal, okay, what are you going to have to do? You're going to have to appeal to a nation of whiners. Now, it's an important principle. What you win people with is what you win them to. Okay, so if you're appealing to whiners, uh, you're not looking for people who want to win. Okay, this is very critical then in how a, a congregation approaches the the way that we reach the world. First Corinthians chapter nine. First Corinthians chapter nine in verse twenty four. First Corinthians nine twenty four he said, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run but only one receives the prize. Run in such a way you may win. Everyone who competes in the games, the Olympics, uh, exercises self-control in all things. They then do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. Therefore, I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as not beating my ear, the air, but I discipline my body and make it my slave, so that after I preach to others, I myself will not be disqualified. There's no whining in there. See, that's winning winning and so if your approach is to just make excuses for the fact that we're all whiners together that's what you're going to get and what that's going to do is that's going to destroy that congregation over a period of time any congreg now I'm, I've lived long enough to see that happen with basically the instrumental side see and it's happened right now with the non-instrumental side Across, I mean, I'm not just talking a few isolated instances, you know, I mean, across the board. Because they don't have a mechanism to reach in and make disciples other than trying to invite people to the building. See, it's, it's a very foundational point, but it's absolutely critical for the, for the future of the church. See, that's what I'm doing in these orientation, trying to, you know, I guess orientation, uh, uh, editorializing, whatever. I guess, let's call it you know, orientation. That's a pretty good word. Uh, but see, gotta, we have to keep certain things in mind for the future of the congregation, the future of the church, and the future of our, our little movement as a whole. See, back, going back to Matthew chapter 28. See, a welfare system, see, like Mill's pointing out, a welfare system destroys people. It destroys their ability to be self-reliant, and therefore, it destroys the toughness and destroys the endurance necessary for the Christian life. See, it's a direct, the welfare system is a direct attack on the key point necessary to be a Christian who sustains his faith. And uh, so the self-reliant people, see, that, that cross the, the frontiers, they were a people then prepared for the gospel to come to them. So it's no accident that it started in what was called the Western Reserve or what's now Northeastern Ohio. No accident it started. No accident that it had tremendous progress in Kentucky and Tennessee. See, and the guys from Tennessee, then they took it to Texas. In the uh, 1986 edition of the National Geographic, they had a special article on, on Texican independence. That's what they used to call it, Texican. Um, <coughs> And they showed the pool where Sam Houston was immersed. And they had his quote that he wondered if there's any fish left alive after all those sins that got washed away. In that. 
See, that tells you that's a, an Acts 2.38 immersion that Sam Houston went through. See, that's coming from Tennessee. A lot of Tennessee-Texas connections. See, it, 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 it rode on the backs of a self-reliant people. Okay, so we need to process that. And so Matthew 28, I don't, this is probably the first time you've ever seen this, but I'm going to try to point it out to you. Matthew 28, 19 and 20 Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, immersing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all I commanded you, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. See, it's just very clear that we have to go. You know, I mean, it's okay to invite people to assembly if you're working with them. Okay, that doesn't hurt. But trying to have your thrust of evangelism means get people through the door and have some of it stick. It won't work in today's society. I guarantee you it will not work. You have too many you know, barriers that you have to, to work your way through to, to get to that. So starting with the first one, is there such a thing as truth? Yeah, I mean, isn't it amazing? But again, it's a society, see, that's weak. It's a society that doesn't have to face the elements. You know, if you're, if you're trying to get across uh, the, the uh, Platte River, the South Platte, as it's coming into the, the merging with the North Platte in, uh, you know, in Nebraska, um, and you got across the South Platte, you know, that's definite truth that you're, and could, you know, and a lot, I mean, they learned that when you got to a river, you crossed that river at night, you didn't wait till the morning, because by morning that thing could be so flooded you weren't going to cross it. See, that was the mistake the Donner Party made, you know, the, the Indians see, that were kind of guiding them across the Sierra, said, big snow come, big snow come, must go, must go, must go, big snow come. Stop three miles short of the top. Ten feet of snow that night. See, didn't, didn't finish. See, these are tremendous lessons here from, from history that help us to process. So, our job is to figure out on our own personal basis, see, how to get those conversations going. You have to reach into people's lives. We have to help them move a lot, across a lot of barriers, a, a people that has been weakened, you know, by the, uh, the nanny state and help them to come over and become a self-reliant people who don't make excuses and who get things done, get done for the Lord. So... Mel's got a comment. Almost done with the editorial. May think of another spot. I left out one important part. Uh, during the last five years, the amount of uh, um, homeless doubled. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they spent $5 billion to solve the homeless problem. It doubled. Yeah. 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 You know, uh, Bobo Romano up in uh, Great Falls, Bobo's from Togo. And uh, Mary Cassie, all well, you guys remember Cassie. And uh, so he was telling us he works at the uh, pasta company. It's part, you know, part of the grain elevator up there that they make pasta of different kinds and uh, ship it all over the United States. And uh, so he said this guy came to work, 32 years old guy. So Bobo gets in a conversation with him. He says, uh, so what prompted you to come to work? He said, well, my mother said that I have to start paying rent. 32 years old, right? My, my mother said, uh, you know, Bobo said he lasted two, two weeks. You know, that was too much to come to work every day. And it's much more important to stay home and play video games. 32-year-old guy, I, I don't think he's unusual. I think there's a tremendous amount of that. See, and that's the society that we have to reach into. You know, I mean, what kind of toughness this guy got? Can't even hold a job. Can't even hold a job. And see, we're seeing an increasing amount of that. In his series, uh, How Shall We Then Live? Um, you know, he pointed out that, uh, here he pointed out a coin, Roman coin made in the days of uh, Nero. It's a high quality coin. 300 years later, he showed the coin. See, the quality had greatly declined. See, because Rome was in that tremendous downward slide. See, have, has there been any decrease in the quality of work uh, that you've noticed since COVID particularly? Yeah, you, you see that across the board, don't you? Okay, 
See, these are, these are signals here. This is the world we've got to go into. And that's why there's got to be this tremendous emphasis on personal evangelism to try to get the conversation going, try to get the study, try to keep the study, try to expand the study. That's the only way that we're going to move forward. And each of us as an individual basis needs to try to make personal commitments. You know, Lance did a very awesome job in the opening today. Uh, and you know, to do what we can. See, sometimes we have to team up with somebody. We can take them so far and need somebody else to help us out. It's okay. But, you know, to get those conversations going. And you have to go through them. I mean, you know, Charlie, I'm, I, I really appreciate Charlie. He's a free man now. <laughs> but, uh, but uh, you know, he tried to have conversations with people at Costco. Costco is a pretty good cross-representation of, of the American public right there. And uh, well, it's tough going, huh, Charlie? Very tough. Okay, that's our world. So you don't, you don't want to be discouraged about it. Just, just keep going. Keep, you know, sooner or later, God's going to bring in contact with somebody. Um, and so our jobs do our job where we are. So. Other comments? Uh, see Mr. Matthew here and Mr. Elliot. When we follow through on... Matthew 28, 19, and 20, it's actually a great competitive advantage for us because one thing you can count on is the general laziness of mankind and the competition, if you will. You know, you can invite, you know, they get people in the doors with the free toasters and the concerts and stuff, but they're not going to work as hard as we are in fulfilling out the Great Commission. And if people are wanting to have their ears tickled, then, yeah, their methods will work better. But as far as truth seekers go, we have a great competitive advantage. Yeah, that's a super point because how many of us had somebody say, you know, we ask a question, you guys show us scripture. See, that's, that's you know, and for truth, that is a tremendous competitive advantage. Good point. Elliot? Thanks. I think that when when God makes a person, he puts within them the need for something higher than themselves, a reliance on something higher than themselves. And when I hear about the stories of the of the frontier people, when I read about it, they had faith. Whether or not they necessarily were correct on scripture, they did have faith in God. And I think that as faith in God has been weakened in the public, as it's been drug under it's it's opened up that that gap again that gap of you know there's only so so far i can go i need to believe in something i need to rely on something beyond myself and since there's no faith there it changes to the government and of course that's purposeful they've designed it that way they want people to rely on the government but i just you know, it's a shame because that reliance is supposed to be on God. We need to rely on God and we need to, we need to understand that he's going to take care of us, not, not someone who has a pretty clear agenda. Yeah. See, who you depend upon for your daily bread is your God. Yeah. Matthew twenty-eight nineteen, that word go. Could you explain um, what an aorist participle is <laughs> yeah okay if you're going to try to translate it literally it doesn't okay there's there's tenses in greek that don't exist in english so you have to try to get an english approximation so generally this is translated go therefore it goes to an imperative um basically it, it sort of has the idea as you're going okay but you have to have a determination to be going, to be as you're going, uh, to, to make disciples. In other words, as you engage in the normal interaction with, with the public, then try to be making disciples would be the thrust of that. Yeah. So. Yeah, maybe even on that, uh, the, the example you used today of the frontiersmen, you know, they were going. They had that mindset. They were going. And so for us as Christians to have that same mentality that you said, that push. And something I was thinking about, um, if, if inviting people to assembly is the main means, then like you said, you're going to have to appeal to 
the the whiners of the world and you're going to be afraid to preach the hard truth but i rem- i was talking with julie this morning and there was a guy young guy years ago in billings kind of a wild dude but he had gone to faith chapel which is big mega church in billings and then he'd come to our assembly and i started bible studying with him a little bit and i said you know is it is this kind of boring because some people think our assemblies are pretty boring compared to the rock show concert he's like actually he said i i found that place boring he's like you guys are real and so truth seekers aren't going to be afraid of, now he again it, it it wasn't the assembly of the saints that converted him but truth seekers aren't afraid of truth they want truth they want you to show them where the scripture says they want and those are the people god's looking for those are the people we're looking for and so um just i appreciate what you're saying just a reminder to us all if people get afraid when you're telling them the truth or run away that's not who god was looking for it's not who we're looking for so keep going until you find the ones that are these are stuff i'm telling myself right now <laughs> and it's just what we got to keep so i really appreciate the mentality you're bringing out today yeah i mean the uh Turn to Ephesians chapter uh, 4. See, sometimes you hear, well, see, I think Edgar Guest wrote a poem entitled, I'd Rather See a Sermon Than Hear One Any Day. Okay, well, that's kind of written from a Methodist perspective. <laughs> okay, I mean, yeah, you, if you ever heard a Methodist sermon, you could see why you'd rather uh, see one. I, I attended the Methodist church in... Uh, Pittsburgh, California. I had a, uh, or actually Antioch. I had a summer job at Pittsburgh for Dow Chemical Company, and there is a little Methodist church across the road. And so, you know, I'm I'm an atheist, but you know, hey, maybe something interesting going on there. And uh, sure enough, the fat lady sang. So was, I think that's where that expression comes from. But uh, you know, I do not remember. I I tended, you know, pretty much every other week. You know, I do not remember a single word the guy said. I do remember that the main function of the adult class, uh, Pittsburgh, five miles down the road, was 75% black. Um, Antioch, as far as they knew, only had two black families in it. And that was a major problem. So the purpose of that Methodist Sunday school class to try to figure out how to get more blacks into Antioch. You know, like, <laughs> I mean, okay. So, uh, no, but they lost it a long time ago. I mean, they never had it, really. See. Ephesians 4, uh, verse 15. I just want to key on one, one phrase here. But speaking the truth in love, okay? You can't just, quote, love people. See, you got to couple that with speaking truth. In fact, if you don't speak truth, you don't love people. See, that's one of, the, one of the key points. If you don't speak truth, you don't really love people. You want them to like you. Because a lot of times, truth's going to make people mad. You know, still wearing my coat. <laughs> Wear my coat, okay? You learned, you know, keep that coat on. May not have time to retrieve it. See, I mean, that's, people don't like truth. Some of them. I mean, the truth seeker likes truth. Now, the non-truth seeker doesn't like truth. See, if you go to John 15, you know, the words of Jesus himself. Jesus, of course, given some, shall we say, last-minute instructions here. John 15, 18. He says, if the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they'll also persecute you. If they kept my word, they'll keep yours also. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know the one who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have sinned, but now they have no excuse for their sin. He who hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would not have sinned, but now they have both seen and hated me and my father as well. But they've done this to fulfill the word that is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. 
See, I mean, no, Jesus' point is, is they hated me. Guess what? You walk in my steps, they're going to hate you. You know, why? If, twice he said, well, verse 22, what did he say? If I had not come and spoken. If he just kept his mouth shut. But he didn't keep his mouth shut. Okay. You know, he drove it at him. See, time after time after time. You know, you can see, I mean, the Gospel of John particularly brings it out. I mean, Jesus is just driving it right at the Jews. And they're not liking it. They're not liking it at all. How many times they try to kill him? So, um, okay, now you don't have to be obnoxious. You know, I mean, Scripture doesn't want us to be an obnoxious. You know, I want to tell you the truth. Well, that doesn't work either. You know, I used the illustration some time ago about uh, going fishing, right? So, um, I used to fish on South Meadow Creek and North Meadow Creek on what was then my grandfather's ranch. And, uh, you know, both of those small streams, uh, South Meadow Creek, especially small. And uh, so, you know, there are some things, okay, you, you didn't let your shadow hit the creek, right? Your shadow hits the creek, what happens to the fish in that hole? Boom, they're gone, okay? And, uh, and you don't make a lot of racket when you're coming up to the creek, okay? And what you do is you put your bait in a little upstream so it comes down natural like. You just plop your bait in there. What happens to the fish? <laughs> Gone. See, so it's like that. When we're fishing for men, you know, we're not using nets. We're using lines these days. But when you're fishing for men, you've got to think about some of these things, okay? If I come tromping up to the bank, you know, I went fishing, but I wasn't really after a fish. I was going, yeah, I was going fishing, okay? See, but if I really want to catch fish, see, I use my head. And I, I, I work things naturally. The best evangelism video I ever saw, I was at uh, Alan Ford's house in Pennsylvania, and he was watching a video put out by a <laughs> college professor at MHU whose uh, professorship was in recreation. That would be a tough gig, <laughs> being a professor in recreation, right? And uh, so this guy had produced a video on fly fishing, right? It was, it, was, it was a great video, and uh, so he was talking about, say, the difference between your $50 rod that you might get at, at Walmart compared to the $1,500 rod that you might get at uh, one of the more specialized stores. He said, what's the difference? He said, well, that $50 rod, you know, your dry fly out there doesn't look natural. He said, your $1,500 rod it has just that right amount of, of wiggle and tension in it, to where the fly sitting on the top of the water looks natural. See, important point. Are you, are you just going fishing or are you trying to catch fish? And uh, what I thought was really interesting is when, you know, they're doing this with the, you know, what, what's it called when the, when the fly is going to land on the top of the water? It's called the presentation. Presentation. Fishing for men. Presentation. See, speak the truth in love. You got to have love when you're speaking truth. You got to be really concerned about their soul. You can't be just saying, "Well, I'm getting Bible study." You know, you have to be concerned. You're trying to help people get it right. But on the other hand, you don't back away from the truth either. You have a, you know, I, that's why I think the track to run on is so important because you start where you need to start. Proof that the Bible is the Word of God. Okay, you got to get the scripture established as the authority, period. That, that's, I mean, at some point, you've got to get to that point where you've got that established. If you don't get that established, sooner or later they're going to bail on you when they don't like what the scripture says. See, so you've got to get that nailed down so that, okay, from this point on, whatever the book says, that's the way it is, whether we like it or not. A lot of it we may not like. See, so you're, you're nailing it down, Okay. Then, then you hit the plan of salvation, right? See, one of the guys I'm working with right now, he said, you know, the, uh, the more you're studying with me, he said, uh, that narrower that gate's getting. <laughs> yep, exactly. See, because they're, they're starting to run that calculation, aren't they? They're starting to run that calculation. 
And, uh, you know, and a lot of people bail. You know, we get rid of a lot more of uh, proof that the Bible is the Word of God and God's plan of salvation than we do Holy Spirit books. Okay? Because why? You're losing people in the process. They're coming uh, up against the truth. You know, I'll tell you this story again about uh, one of the ladies I used to work with. She called me up and she was attending the Church of Christ in Great Falls and and uh, she wanted, she had a Bible study going with six ladies and she wanted seven sets of my study books. She said, Jay, these are the best I've ever seen. Okay? So I took the books up to her and a couple weeks later I called her to ask how the study was going. She said, well, we had to quit, we had to quit using your books. I said, uh, well, why was that? She said, well, you know, you tell this story about when you went, it was actually when Marcy Dingman answered the phone when she was about 16 years old in Belgrade. <laughs> okay, she doesn't even remember. I remember. You remember, okay. And uh, so I walked in, and here's a Baptist traveling evangelist, a Baptist pastor, and, uh, you know, going through the four spiritual laws with, uh, with Shirley, that would be Marcy's mom. And I challenged him, uh, okay, what about baptism, Okay. I say, Mr. Traveling Evangelist, he forgets all about Shirley Dingman. He turns the four fourths of his attention on me at that point. Okay. And I hadn't learned to keep my coat on yet. Uh, but it was uh, interesting how, you know, uh, vehement he was against immersion being necessary for forgiveness of sins. And uh, so I told that story. I put a little bit of that story in God's plan of salvation because I'm trying to help people process the fact, look it, there's only one way, okay? And these other churches are not telling the truth. And I said, so she said, if you could just take that story out, it'd be helpful. I said, well, I'm not taking it out. I said, it's there for a reason. She said, well, one of the ladies didn't like that story and so we just had to quit the Bible study. Ah. Why did we quit the Bible study? Somebody didn't like what was being said. So you veer off from the truth, right? Okay, that's what goes on time after time after time. Don't want to face the truth. The restoration movement of today, uh, Christian churches are for the most part gone. The instrumentals are gone. A few few here and there, non-instrumentals are going the same way, just across the board. Check their websites. Check their websites. They'll tell you. And uh, so this, this is really important for the future of this congregation, important for the future of the church. You've got to keep the focus on going, making disciples, immersing those disciples, and continue to teach them. may require some personal growth on our part. Okay? We may have to increase our people skills. I mean, that's, that's all part of it, uh, learning how to get conversations going, how to drift the conversation in the right direction. Um, at some point, you know, you, you know, you make the close. The close is, do you have Tuesdays or Thursdays available for Bible study? That's your close, okay? And, uh, you know, that's, if you don't ask for the business, guess how many sales you make? You don't make any. See, it's a very basic principle. So we're reaching into a world that's uh, really messed up. I mean, the, the Cretans, you know, as I mentioned in Titus, they got nothing on us, okay? The, uh, so just, uh, you know, foundational point, foundational point. It's important this congregation, the other congregations we work with, keep that focus. Don't keep that focus. You're going to go the way of the restoration movement and other dodo birds. So, any other closing thoughts here? Yeah, Elliot? In uh, 2 Corinthians 2.17 is what I thought of in this whole conversation. For we are not like many peddling the word of God, but as from sincerity, but as from God we speak in Christ in the sight of God. And, you know, what I always think about peddling is mm -hmm. that you're trying to 
um, you're not giving all the information in order to sell it easier. You know, when you pedal a car, you don't give all the information about the, the tough stuff about the car, the stuff that might need fixed. You just give all the, like, oh, you know, it's a nice color. It's, a, it's this car type that you might want, this model that you might want. You're pedaling it, you're trying to get it off your hands, and then when it's in someone else's lap, then they can, you know, they then they have to deal with the hard stuff, or they just get rid of the car. But um, if we're not pedaling the Word of God, but we're properly explaining it to people, properly showing it to people, telling them, listen, this is the tough stuff about it, this is the stuff, and what's cool about the Bible is it's not, um, what the Bible needs to change, it's not fixing the Bible, it's fixing you. But here's the things you need to change. If all those things are included, we aren't peddling the Word of God. We're giving it to them straight, and that's going to be a lot more beneficial for their souls in the long run. Mm -hmm. So that's just what I thought. Just of. question. Have you run up against a little bit of this in trying to set up your personal Bible studies and, <laughs> and, and having people bail on you? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. See, and so the, that's the that's the point. You just got to keep going because, you know, the next person's around the corner because, you know, a, a significant percentage of people you got now aren't going to make it. 